Welcome to the Wellesley College Career Education webinar titled Journey to the Boardroom. Today's webinar will be taped and will be posted on the Career Education website in approximately 24 hours after the session. We plan to leave time for audience questions at the end, so please chat your questions on Zoom to the webinar host. My name is Margo Label, and I will be moderating our panel today. I am joined today by three very accomplished alumni. As a reminder to, to the biographies you have already received, I will provide a brief introduction. First joining us, Cynthia Glassman has had a very distinguished career with over 40 years in the public and private sectors, including service as a commissioner of the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Cynthia has written extensively on corporate governance, financial reporting, risk management, and competitiveness issues. Cynthia currently serves on two public company boards. Second joining us, Leanne Pelletier had a long successful operating career in telecom, culminating in seven and a half years as CEO, president, and chairman of public company, Alaska Communications. Leanne currently serves on three public company boards. Finally joining us, Beth Stewart has started out in investment banking and brings over 20 years of corporate director experience to her current CEO of TrueStar role, recruiting exceptional directors for companies of all sizes in the US. Beth is a recognized expert on boredom diversity and other corporate governance issues. Next slide. We will focus today on public companies. For the sake of today's conversation, we will, however, consider the journey to the boardroom similar to be somewhat similar for these two types of companies. More typically than not, the primary differences from a board perspective are as follows. The public company board directors are accountable to the shareholders, while in a private company, the board is the supreme governing body. The board director role can take on an advisory role in private companies to the extent families or other investors own a majority share, as an example. And thirdly, the legal exposure to the board director is less in a private company, and as such, the compensation levels could be lower as well. Also, mutual fund boards have many of the same considerations as corporate boards, but we encourage you to check the Career Education website for a January 2018 webinar in which we specifically address mutual fund board issues. Finally, while nonprofit boards are very interesting to consider, these are not a topic under discussion today and we do not see them in board position specifications as a qualifier for corporate board roles. Nonprofit profit boards can be addressed separately with the career education group. Next slide. I will address the first question today to each of our panelists. What boards have each of you served on and what has made you qualified for these boards? Let's kick off with Cynthia. Hi, thanks, Margo. I'm currently on two corporate boards, Discover Financial Services, which is the large large financial services company, where I chair the audit committee. And I'm also on Navigant Consulting, a global consulting firm focusing on financial services, uh, energy, and healthcare, where I chair the nominating and governance committee and serve on the audit committee. And I have served on the compensation committee there. What qualified me for these boards is for Discover especially, my financial services background, I've been in financial services of, uh, throughout my career, in a, mostly in a, in a policy role, in consulting and in the government, uh, and also my regulatory background. I started at the Fed and uh, just before Discover, I was a commissioner at the SEC. And for Navigant, uh, my economics background, I'm a PhD economist, uh, my consulting experience, I have uh, 15 years of that. Uh, financial services, since that was one, is one of our lines of business. And my regulatory background, especially the corporate governance uh, 
emanating from the SEC. Back to you, Margo. Thank you, Cynthia. And Leanne, what, what can you tell us? Morning, everybody. So since 2003, I've served on seven corporate boards, six different industries, currently on three across uh, two global companies in very different uh, sectors, logistics and telecom and solar uh, energy. And the third board is on the home services uh, side of the uh, economy. So I think the reasons why uh, folks have approached uh, me for board seats is that uh, I was a public company CEO, as Marco mentioned, for seven and a half years. That just uh, resonates with some of the searches that go on. I would say additionally, others saw me in action in other venues and got to see how uh, my, uh, my thoughts uh, process through business challenges um, I am a financial expert because I had to sign my life away uh, through SOX attestations uh, as a uh, public CEO. And the very earliest indicators I think that served me well is that I spent a lot of time in my C-suite role before becoming a CEO. I spent a lot of time in the boardroom of my employer as chief strategy officer, taking the board through m a opportunities etc so i think i had um, some uh, detailed awareness of how boardrooms work and those things together i think uh, positioned me for the public board opportunities back to you margo beth what do you have to share well i what i'm going to do if that's all right is uh, very quickly say how i got on corporate boards which is sometimes still the way people get on corporate boards, but I thought I would give uh, five quick examples of women we've gotten on boards uh, in, in the modern era and have that be more useful than my story. Uh, my story is that on every board that I got on, uh, with the possible exception of one, and I went on my first board just to put this in historical perspective. Uh, the first one was in 1993. Uh, so how it worked in 1993 isn't so relevant to how it works now. But all of them were connections. They came from having been an investment banker, having investment banking experience, that while uh, pre-Sarbanes-Oxley qualified me to run the audit committee, after that I uh, was not a financial expert to run the committee, but just to sit on the audit committee. And um, I would say that I got on those boards through connections. Um, so let me tell you about uh, very quickly, and, and please feel free to interrupt, Margo, if this is, is, takes too long, but um, we had a request from a technology company that wanted a cyber expert, and we found, and also somebody who had government experience, so military, NSA, FBI, um, and we found a two-star Air Force general who had just announced her retirement, um, who ran the 24th Air Force, which happened to be the Cyber Command. So uh, the point of this message that let me just say in advance what it is, is how specific the requirements are and how specific the people fill those requirements. That was one. Uh, we put um, a woman on the board of Sonos. Maybe all of you have a Sonos speaker. Um, before they went public and they needed an audit chair and we added the woman who was the CFO from Restoration Hardware. Um, so why did that work? She had previously been a partner at uh, one of the big four firms. She was the CFO. She'd also been promoted to co-president at Restoration Hardware. She had retail experience and she understood because Restoration Hardware I think had maybe had some arrangement with Sonos to sell some Sonos products. Um, we are in the middle of working on a chemical company search where, believe it or not, we have found this woman CEO of a chemical company uh, who happens also to be in her early 40s, um, and she is likely to get an offer one day this week. And in that particular case, they wanted operating experience. Uh, we did a search for a large technology hardware and software company in Silicon Valley, um, and they wanted, um, again, somebody who had actually worked in uh, a technology company, so oper a operational experience, and we found a woman that had uh, worked at um, EMC, 
uh, for her whole career in a variety operating. Uh, then she did well there, so they put her into HR, and then she did well there, and they put her into IT. So she had the a whole spectrum of experiences, um, and she joined that board. And they also sort of like the fact that she was from the East Coast, and everybody else on the board was basically West Coast. And the last example is we did um, a, a search for a potash mining company, and they wanted somebody who uh, was in what the chairman called the dirty fingernails business. And he told me I could do the search, but he didn't think I'd ever find anybody because there aren't any women in that space. Um, and, he, and we did find a woman who was a very senior executive at Caterpillar Tractor, which did relate to mining because the mine all had big Caterpillar tractors in them. And she ran a $20 billion global business for Caterpillar tractor. And our client, I think the whole market cap was, you know, 15 or 16 billion. So she ran a bigger business than the company itself. So that tells you a little bit about the kinds of people we've been getting on boards. Thank you, Beth. Those are great examples. Switching to, to our next uh, question and slide. Cynthia, how would you describe the role of a board and its directors? What does it mean to be an, an independent director? Sure, well, starting with what does it mean to be an independent director? That's someone who has no material relationship with the company or the management other than being on the board. Uh, and, and that the reason the uh, boards have indirect, uh, independent directors is to uh, make sure that they are representing the shareholders and not management uh, in their duties. And the roles of the directors include, as the slide shows, uh, review of corporate strategy. Uh, typically, uh, the board will have at least one board meeting with significant focus on um, the strategy, uh, discussions with management about the strategy. And then throughout the year at meetings, they will uh, discuss and evaluate the strategy and compare performance to strategic expectations. Uh, then a second really important part of the role is developing a plan for CEO succession. Uh, typically, uh, that's discussed by the full board at least once a year. Uh, as sometimes more often. And there are two parts of that. One is long-term succession in case uh, the CEO retires for whatever reason or leaves, uh, but also uh, an immediate plan in case something happens to the CEO. CEOs hit the tr a truck or there's significant litigation or fraud or something that requires an immediate person to step in. And those may not be the same. Then third, uh, setting CEO and other senior executive compensation. Normally that is uh, developed within the compensation committee and brought to the board, to the full board for approval. Then overseeing compliance, risk management and financial reporting. Normally that's done uh, by the uh, audit committee, uh, but some companies also have a risk committee in which case the risk management piece would be covered by the risk committee. And setting the appropriate tone at the top, that's, that's culture. And it's important that the board uh, has the appropriate policies and um, practices that set the culture that the board wants. And uh, it's one of the ways for boards to uh, find out if the culture is what they expect it to be, is to meet people below the C-suite uh, go to the locations of the company when that's appropriate uh, to basically set, um, make sure that what they think the culture is, is in fact what the culture is. And it's also important to ask the right questions uh, and expect uh, good answers. So if, if an issue has come up at another company that, that would be troubling to ask at your company, uh, are we doing that? Could we be doing that? And how do we know we're not doing that? So back to you, Marco. Thank you, Cynthia. We're going to take our, our third question here and, and direct it to Beth. Beth, what does a board director role entail? Is a, a board director role a, a full-time role? Are the roles compensated, et cetera? 
Uh, so a, a board director role is not a full-time role and they are compensated. Uh, generally, uh, there are four meetings a year and generally the schedule is uh, that the directors get together at, uh, in the afternoon of the day before the meeting. So for instance, uh, two, you, you, would, you would get there for lunch on Tuesday or two o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday, have committee meetings, the audit committee, the nominating committee, the compensation committee, some combination. Sometimes they're now technology committees or policy committees, regulatory committees. Uh, it depends on the specific situation. The committees meet in the afternoon, there's a short break and, and generally a group would get together for dinner and then reconvene again at uh, you know, plus or minus eight o'clock in the morning um, and then have a board meeting uh, where the committees would report on, on their activities. The management team would give a report on what's happened in the prior quarter. Um, stra strategy would be discussed, succession planning might be discussed there may or may not be lunch and the meeting is over at lunchtime, one o'clock, two o'clock. Um, and so that's standard. There are lots of different things. This was one that I found particularly um, funny. Uh, we had one client from Texas, don't, not, don't mean to offend anybody on the phone who might be from Texas, but they actually met, met on Mondays and Tuesdays and on the Sunday night before the um, board meeting, they would have a campfire meeting uh, where they discuss strategy and this was an all male board. Uh, so they've now got a woman on it and I think they're still doing the campfires. Um, so that's sort of the kinds of the, uh, time frame uh, in terms of compensation. Uh, it's plus or minus $250,000 and it's generally a combination of cash and equity. And uh, depending on a technology company, generally the cash will be lower and the equity will be higher, but um, sort of across the board, I would say with um, an annual retainer plus uh, committee fees, the cash compensation can be around 100,000 and the equity could be around 150. Um, if it's a bigger board, the compensation could be higher. Sometimes some boards will give a stock grant to people coming uh, you know, joining the board for the first time. Uh, time commitments can vary. What I've d explained is a normal company with normal, um, an, in a normal situation, but if you have an activist on the board, if you have a problem with your CEO where you're thinking of terminating and replacing he or she, or if the company has serious financial problems, these time commitments uh, can expand dramatically. Um, and just to, an insert here on an experience I had with a company that did uh, go bankrupt um, in the financial crisis. And um, we happened to back then, although we don't do this as much, have um, meeting fees. So anytime you're on a call or in an in-person meeting, uh, there was a fee, which was one of the reasons I was able to track this so closely. But I think over a two year period, I might have had 95 or $100,000 of meeting fees, which in indicated how many meetings there were. So um, I, I think, Margo, I answered what you asked, but if I missed something, please let me know. Thank you. Great, great uh, insights into the, especially the variability of the uh, structure of the meetings. Thank you. Um, switching to the, the fourth question, uh, Cynthia, what are the legal responsibilities and exposure for board directors? Uh, well, directors are elected by the shareholders and they have a, a fiduciary responsibility to the company and uh, the interests of the shareholders. And they have uh, key duties. One is a duty of care. They're supposed to get sufficient information uh, before they make decisions. And that means that they're supposed to read the materials, which can be extensive. They're supposed to follow what's going on in the industry so they understand what the company does. Uh, and they're expected to attend essentially all meetings and phone calls. Uh, and as, as Beth mentioned, if there's a crisis situation, there could be a lot of phone calls, especially extra phone calls. So they have to be willing, a board member has to be able to uh, get to those calls uh, that may be unexpected throughout the year. Uh, they, board members also have a duty of loyalty, uh, which means they have to act in the best interest of the shareholders in the company. They cannot have a conflict of interest. They're 
focused on the company here, and they have to act in good faith. Uh, they, their agenda has to be uh, doing what's best for the company. Uh, and then finally, they may have to maintain confidentiality of any information that they talk about in the boardroom. Uh, so that, that stays uh, private. Hope that answers the question, Margo. Thank you, Cynthia. Next uh, question, I'm going to really turn the focus now to what does it take to, to land a board director role? I'm going to start with Beth. Who should consider board service? What personal and professional skills are required to be a board director? How does one know if they are, quote unquote, board ready? Well, generally speaking, the people that are placed on boards, and I, if I hearken back to those examples that I gave you, uh, generally, you're talking about somebody with a specific set of knowledge that is going to fill a skill set gap on a given board. Um, but in addition to that, <clears throat> generally, because what's happening in the boardroom, I mean, that I told you about the two-star Air Force general who is an expert in cybersecurity. It doesn't mean that the, every board meeting uh, you're talking about cybersecurity all the time. Um, I think as has, has been explained already, there are a lot of issues that are gonna come up about, is the CEO right? How do you compensate him? Who are the successors to the CEO? Some of those questions are going to, um, the person in the room has to have sort of sufficient senior executive experience in a significant company so that they're going to have a point of view or be able to follow, on the co follow along with the conversation. Therefore, Generally speaking, it's people who are either C CEOs, and we know the problem there is they're generally men, or um, direct reports to the CEO. And when you think about direct reports to the CEO, um, we've been able to find uh, you know, many, many women, and of course there are uh, women CEOs, most of whom are already on boards. Um, so, uh, so sometimes if the company's really large, um, if you're two levels down from the CEO, but as I explained about this woman that went on the board of the Potash Mining Company, she was two levels below the CEO, but she actually ran a business that was bigger than. So the whole idea is, are you going to have the corporate experiences so that you're gonna be able to deal with the issues? The kinds of things that uh, people that probably aren't ready are people who have a small private company experience. That probably doesn't translate into a corporate boardroom. Um, probably doesn't translate if you've had um, not-for-profit experience. Whether it does or it doesn't, it's perceived as it doesn't. Um, other types of backgrounds, people who are retired audit partners, uh, sometimes people who are retired consultants, um, and as I mentioned, uh, general, general level uh, uh, status in the military. Um, it's really important once you're in the boardroom or for people who are thinking about this to understand the difference between uh, the board and management. So for instance, if you're somebody who really likes to be involved, um, you might not love uh, to be on a board because you're supposed to be supervising slash advising, you're not supposed to be doing. Um, and uh, sometimes boards can be frustrating. Uh, there is a way that the conversation goes on in the boardroom and there's, you know, sometimes the conversations have to take place before or after the meeting. It might not be as direct as you might expect um, in your normal day-to-day -day, um, activities. And it's hard to describe what that, what that means exactly, but if you were being interviewed, some boards are, are really very, very structured and other boards are more flexible and relaxed and you might uh, figure that um, out through interviews. I, I think I should, I feel like I've said enough on that topic and, and people could ask questions if they, if they wanted to. And, and Margo, unless you think that there's something else I should cover. I think we're good, we're good. Thank you, Beth. I'm gonna go to Leanne. Ma'am, what is the process for companies to recruit board directors? Can you help us understand that, please? Sure. So I think my colleagues here mentioned a couple times that um, each board tends to have at least three standing committees. One of them is called the Nominating and Corporate Governance. And inside that committee, um, it does the detailed work on behalf of the full board that uh, has as its mission the continuing relevance of the composition of the board. 
Uh, the reason committees, in fact, do that deep detailed work is so that the full board can focus on things, again, that my colleagues have mentioned, strategy, CEO succession, et cetera. When the committee executes their work, it is against a documented charter of areas of responsibility, and that charter is itself approved by the full board. So there's no mystery about sort of what's that committee off doing. So back to the nominating governance committee, they are the ones that are um, tasked with making sure that the, the board uh, the board room is composed of folks that are tuned to the specific challenges and opportunities that that company faces. It's through life experiences, it's through skills, etc. Uh, it's, it's quite a nuanced process, um, but they build a grid and keep track of where the company's needs are in terms of advisor and overseers and what's in the room today and is there a gap. When director turnover happens, it could be through age or term, it could be voluntary or involuntary, things happen with individuals and director turnover occurs or in some cases boards expand so that uh, the nominating governance committee might propose a change in composition. How they do that is by crafting a specification sheet that the full board looks at and reflects and says, you know what, that's really in tune with what we need. The nominating governance committee then carries on this detailed work and they go outside to find candidates via a recruiter, um, a search advisor, or other channels. And very often uh, boards do tap their own networks and don't go through professionals. But that's shifting a lot and Beth can probably touch more on that. She already has. Um, so the process then, thinking about it from the candidate standpoint, first of all, the candidate must have a calendar that fits with the board meeting schedule. My colleagues, again, did a really good job of explaining that and extra flexibility in their life to take on the very frequent um, unforeseens that a board will demand. So to, to recap, candidates are pursued confidentially. You don't apply for a board seat. Um, candidates go through quite extensive, typically, uh, interviews with the NomGov committee, the chairman of the board, the CEO, sometimes the full board, and this can take weeks or even months. Some boards are so forward-looking that they do it a year in advance of the need, and so you really do need to keep in mind what your life will be like, schedule-wise, if you are in, uh, engaging with a board that has a very long lens on this recruitment process. When the choice is narrowed down, background checks are done on the candidates, and offers, if you will, are made by the NomGov committee or the chairman of the board, they can happen anytime throughout the year, but I think as Cynthia pointed out, ultimately all directors and public companies are voted on at the shareholder meeting annually. So you can have a provisional, you know, you, you join, but then you are reaffirmed, if you will, on the full slate at the shareholder meeting. After you're on, a well-organized orientation and continuous onboarding process is a hallmark of good board governance. Um, directors need to have um, a, a well-positioned uh, entry into being effective and contributory in the boardroom. And in the past, I would think that uh, it's fair to say that directors could sit back for a while and learn and watch. That's no longer the case. You're expected to contribute to board work uh, from the get-go. So that orientation is critical. And then finally, another check that the NomGov committee oversees, which I think is pertinent to the topic, is director evaluations are used, um, sometimes of the individuals, but essentially um, always for the construct of the committee and the full board, essentially looking in the mirror and saying, are we doing what we need to and are we effective, constructive, et cetera? And these identify areas of opportunity. And the reason I'm mentioning that is sometimes that feeds into um, board recruitment processes. Back to you, Margo. Thank you, Leanne. So with all that said, let's, let's talk about uh, a question I'm going to address to all three of our uh, panelists. For those of uh, folks on the call interested in board director roles, how do you uh, recommend that they go about uh, becoming a board director? And, and how did you land your director roles? I'm going to 
um, addresses to Cynthia and Leanne as, as candidates and then Beth is, is the recruiter. But Cynthia, do you want to start, please? Sure. The, the buzzword is network and network some more. Uh, has a, that's already been said. Um, it's important that not just that you network and with your uh, colleagues, acquaintances, and people who might hear of openings on boards, but also to make sure the recruiters uh, know who you are and uh, your availability. And included in networking is uh, tell people very clearly that you're interested in being on boards. Uh, not everybody will assume that, so you have to say it uh, and tell them. Now, how I got on my first board, uh, which was Discover, uh, when I was leaving the government in early 2009, in the middle of the financial crisis, um, I sent an email as I was on my way out the door with my new contact information and just a statement saying I was interested in being on corporate boards if anybody heard of anything. I didn't include a bio or, or resume at that point. I was still in the government for another couple of weeks and uh, I didn't want to do anything that would be considered inappropriate. But very quickly, I got an email back from a, a professional friend who said, who asked if they could send this to a client. So I said, of course, and that client turned out to be uh, Discover. They had gone public a few years before. They had a terrific board, but two of their board members were rolling off uh, to become board members of some of the uh, significant problem institutions at the time, and they couldn't stay on Discover. So my particular background fit perfectly uh, with their needs at the time. They had just become a holding company overseen by the Fed. I had 12 years of Fed experience in the beginning of my career. Uh, I was in, as I said before, I was in financial services for my whole career. And I had just come from the SEC commissioner role and undersecretary of commerce. So it just fit. And I got on that board within a month or two, which is highly unusual. It takes, it normally takes a long time, uh, as I think both Beth and Leanne have alluded to. My second board uh, wasn't quite so quick. About six months after I joined Discover, I was contacted by a recruiter to join Navigant. Uh, and that was a slower process. Um, but uh, both boards um, entailed a lot of interviews with a number of the board members, the NomGov committee, uh, the chairman, CEO. Uh, and I personally felt it was important to talk to the external auditor, uh, outside counsel, the in head of internal audit, uh, and doing my own due diligence. Uh, it's important, I don't know if anybody said this yet, but it's really important when you join a board that you uh, are comfortable with the culture of the board, the integrity of the board, integrity is key, and also that you're really interested in what the board does. Uh, you have to have a passion and an interest for the, the business of the company. Uh, because you're, you're spending a lot of time on this and uh, that's important. So back to you, Marco. Very good, thank you. And Leanne, what ex were your experiences like? Well, I would think mine is pretty unusual. My first public company board seat came about as a result of being recruited as a public company CEO. I also uh, secured the chairman um, role along with that. So I was CEO and chair of my first public company board. That's a really unusual path. After that, um, the investors in that company and a couple of other people who saw me in action at investor relations uh, conferences, et cetera, uh, tapped me, they knew quite well, even back then, that there's room in a CEO's life for only one other board. Uh, but those were opportunities that came about because the investment community actually saw that what I had produced in the one firm and said, you know, you might be great at this company as well. And beyond that, it was networking. I think I referenced that earlier. I will say that it's really important to be sure the fit is good for you as well as for the company and probably that 
will be things that others draw on as well. But that's a really important, um, really important matter in the pursuit. It's got to be right on a number of levels beyond schedule. Thank you, Leanne. So uh, let's go to the next slide for Beth to tell us about uh, the landing aboard role. Uh, thanks, Margo. <clears throat> and also, I'm so excited that the first bullet point is board bio and resume because I'm the only person in the United States that I know of. Uh, I say that slightly tongue in cheek since I obviously haven't done a survey that does not think you need a board bio. Um, and I'll explain why people tell you to write them and I'll tell you why I don't think it's necessary. Um, people will advise women and somebody has sent a question in about uh, the, the groups that charge for um, board services, you know, board preparation services. But one of the things that people will, will charge you for is to help you write your board bio. And as a person that is looking at candidates, I much prefer to see a chronological CV that says uh, what you did, who you did it with, what your reporting relationship was, what were the years that you did it, what were, you know, what were your responsibilities, what was the size of your budget or your P&L or the size of the company. And then I'm going to figure out whether or not it's a fit. And what happens with board bios, it's a lot of flowery language about what a great leader somebody is, what wonderful personality they have, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not the facts. And the facts, I don't think that you can take the, uh, if you're not really right for what we need in a particular situation, having it put into a nice board bio isn't going to change it. It just makes it more difficult to figure it out. And a lot of women stress over this board bio thing and, um, and I think they shouldn't. So a compromise might be uh, that if you want to have an introductory paragraph that's sort of board bio-like, as long as it then evolves into um, a chronological resume, at least we here at True Star uh, will find that to be really helpful. Um, the elevator speech with your value add, you know, it's, it's, to me, that's, should, that's a verbal shades of the board bio. Um, yes, if, for instance, uh, somebody, if, if a company wants, is to going through a digital transformation and they want somebody with a digital background, um, if you can't speak to that, uh, you're not, you know, fairly succinctly about what you did, there's, you're probably not the right person. If somebody wants a CFO uh, from a technology company to chair their technology company, you know, again, I, I don't know how coming up with an elevator speech, it, it either, either you are it or you aren't it. Uh, sometimes there are nuances that are important to pull out. If it turns out that you actually spent a lot of time in Europe and a company is looking for that and it isn't really highlighted, it can certainly be something you'll highlight. Sometimes if you do something that's quite complicated that somebody like me as the intermediary can't understand, sometimes I ask candidates to write bullet points for me about how they match the spec so that I represent them correctly. That's all to me slightly different than this concept of an elevator pitch. I mean, it's not like you're, it's not to me a marketing meeting. It's more substantive than that. And it's also more clear cut about either you're right for it or you're not. Um, so other things, referrals are the key and don't write letters. It's correct. There's no point in writing letters. They go into the circular file. In fact, I've had a CEO send me a letter that a woman wrote to him and say, could you please tell her to stop writing to me? Um, Network with CEO, board directors, lawyers, and auditors, absolutely, uh, great idea. Uh, place your resume with recruiters, great idea, but again, uh, underscore resume uh, with details. Prepare well for interviews, it's really critical that you do that. Uh, we help our candidates do that by one, giving them a package of information on the company uh, just to make it easy uh, for them, or you know, have, they have less research to do. Uh, but also, uh, we talk to candidates before they have the interview, make sure they know who the people are that they're going to be talking to, what certain sensitivities might be, and, uh, and then we have a debrief afterwards with them. Um, given that you have a legal risk, be sure to do your due diligence, as was already described. Uh, sometimes you don't need to do quite as much due diligence as what Cynthia, I mean, I don't always see what Cynthia, uh, people doing exactly what Cynthia said. But certainly you want to 
uh, make sure you know if there are problems where they are and that might require conversations with CFO, internal audit, um, and outside counsel. Um, and you should make sure that they have DNO insurance, uh, absolutely. I know a woman who uh, two days ago told me she was on a smaller board. I don't know that it was public. She had been asking them about DNO insurance for two years. They never did it and she's going to get off the board. Um, and then maintain confidentiality. Uh, I have a slightly different point of view about confidentiality as it relates only to this uh, board process, N not, not all the other aspects in the boardroom. You do need to maintain confidentiality there. But um, you know, the board process and, and the selection of a director is not a market moving event. Um, I encourage people, whether we're working with them or not, if they feel like calling and having us help them talk through you know, what's going on with the search, why is it taking so long, why weren't they selected, you know, whatever, we're, we're really happy to do that. And you can tell us who the company is and it's absolutely fine. Um, personally, I think some of this confidentiality around those parts of the board process come from, uh, you know, sort of the, you know, maintaining an elitist notion um, that might have started uh, with men. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's really fine to talk with other people and get advice and share stories or whatever. Um, the last thing, uh, the last two points I would make, one is I would not worry about the size or prestige of a company. We haven't talked about private companies much, but there's a lot to be said for joining a private company board. Um, slightly different issues that you might want to think about, but certainly an option uh, that's, uh, that can be valuable. But uh, I wouldn't, oh, some people worry about the size of the company or the prestige of the company. Um, and if that's your thing, then let that be a criteria. But there is something to be said for the smaller companies, the growing companies, um, because a lot of people that I talk to, men and women, say sometimes they're more rewarding. Uh, the last thing I'd say is if you don't get on a board or you don't get on as quickly, oh, sorry, well, I forgot to say this in one of my earlier slides, really important, the question of age. Um, so there are some people that are too young to go on a board or uh, if they're young, they have to still have a lot of this uh, stature, you know, understanding of how the company works or they have to have a really specific um, set of skills that are technology based. So digital marketing or, you know, a senior role in, frankly, a Silicon Valley company, if you're younger, that is valued outside of Silicon Valley. But the sweet spot on age is, is really sort of uh, 45 to 60. And the other side of this is people who are uh, certainly beyond 65. Uh, doesn't mean that people beyond 65 don't get on boards, but it's not common. And, and one of the reasons is that uh, when boards start to do a board search, they often in today's world, given the age of a lot of directors, are trying to lower the average age on the board. And so they specifically ask for us to find, you know, directors that are, you know, in their 50s. Um, so I, I wanted to mention that. And then another advantage of, as you're looking for boards, if you're recently retired, uh, you heard us all talk about the time constraints that can come up on a board. So recently retired means you still have fresh experience, um, but that you have the time to spend. The last thing I want to say is it's really helpful for you to understand the numbers. Um, I don't remember whether it was Cynthia or Leanne or both of them mentioned uh, openings. You know, what I say is, I hope, I don't know whether you can all hear the noise in, uh, on the street here. I hope it's not distracting. I'm in New York in a conference room. Um, but they, the, um, there are only six to eight percent open spots. Um, there are only six to eight percent open spots on Fortune 500 board seats every year. That's the rollover. That's the people that have decided for whatever reason or they're not standing for re-election. It's, it's not very many at all if you do the math. Um, and still, although the, there is an increasing number of those spots that go to women, still the majority of those spots go to men. So when you don't get on a board um, or you don't get on it as quickly as you'd like to, the, you just have to um, not take it personally or feel terrible or think there's something wrong with you. There, it's just a very um, selective and challenging process where there aren't that many opportunities to start with. And it's just good to maintain that uh, perspective. 
Thank you for the, your valuable insights. Appreciated. I'm going to now jump into our concluding question for all of our panelists to now uh, the flavor we're looking for is so what's it really like to be on a board? And so the question is, uh, can you tell us about uh, how you were really able to make a meaningful difference for the board on which you served as well, which every Wellesley uh, grad wants to do as well as uh, when were you potentially the most challenged in your role? And we'll start with Cynthia as we uh, hop to the end of the agenda here. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Marga. Um, as I mentioned, uh, one of the things I brought to the board at, at Discover, uh, what, what was particularly important to them about me was my regulatory background since they had just become regulated by the Fed when I joined them. Uh, and that turned out to be uh, particularly valuable when we came under a Federal Reserve regulatory order, consent order, which is public. Uh, but as chairman of the audit committee, the fact that, that I had been a regulator myself uh, helped me understand the perspective of our regulators, what their perspective was, what their expectations were. And it helped me uh, sort of guide some of the other board members who, who weren't as familiar with what regulators do and, and what the regulated companies have to do. And it, I was able to provide some advice uh, and support to management as well uh, to make sure that our regulatory efforts were addressing the issues. Uh, so that I think I felt, I felt that I really added value there uh, and continue to. Uh, one challenge for me, that was one of your other questions, Margo, was I was asked to join the uh, compensation committee of the other board just when after or about the time that we received a negative say on pay vote. That was particularly challenging, not just because we had that negative say on pay vote, which would be a challenge for anybody, but I had never been uh, involved in compensation at a public company or any company for that matter. So I really had to gear up on what, what I had to do just as a committee member at the same time that we were dealing with the, all the issues surrounding the say on pay vote. So that was a particular challenge. I learned a lot, um, which is something that as you're on a board, different issues come up and different board members have different expertise. You're not expected to know everything about everything. But when things come up, you have to learn about the things you don't know. Uh, and, and that's um, challenging and interesting at the same time. Margo? Leanne. Yes, um, so a couple of things that uh, come to mind about making a difference. I planned my own CEO succession uh, at the firm back in 2010, 2011. And interestingly, I was able to be on a subcommittee three other times since then, working on CEO succession. I felt it from both sides of the table and it's kind of a, uh, it has become a bit of a specialty uh, in that other directors who are going through it and understand that I've experienced it now a total of four times have reached out. It's um, incredibly nuanced, very, very important, but it is some way in which I found uh, the opportunity to contribute meaningfully to some of these new public boards. Another example that comes up is and it was kind of referred to uh, by Cynthia, there are things that hit the fan that you don't necessarily know or that cause you to gather up resource and drop everything and work it. So for one of my companies, a very, very significant whistleblower event happened and I was tapped immediately for an ad hoc committee for the next five months. Uh, it was because I think I was demonstrating an ability for stress management, uh, process awareness, a Rolodex of experts who needed to play a role in how we unwound things, 
etc. So I guess those would be two of a few examples that come to mind. In terms of the challenge and the reality of what it's like, I will just color it in the following way and then hand it over. These are individuals that um, in many, many cases have already worked together for years and you may be the only one joining them. So you're coming into the movie uh, a bit after others have been working through many things together. And so we all have experienced that in different venues, but with public board service, there's a huge amount of liability uh, and care that needs to be taken. So it, it's an art <laughs> about how to land in the middle of that group. You're not with them every day, just a few times a year, and yet to be, um, you are recruited for it, but then the reality of how to integrate yourself, bring your own voice, bring your own independence, perhaps identify ways in which the full board must pursue improvement areas, but recognizing that you've not lived through many years of things that the others on that board may have already done. So it is a, a, a delicate and nuanced uh, relationship building that must happen um, and happen pretty quickly so that you are bringing what you must uh, to that board and to the company. Great, thank you, Leanne. I'm gonna turn it over to Beth for her personal experiences. <clears throat> um, I think just, I just looked at my watch and if it's all right with you, I'm gonna skip my personal experiences as a director and just um, go to some experiences I've had that I found most gratifying when talking to CEOs. Uh, and, and that is, as I think we've again alluded to, um, well, at least I've said it, the reason more women aren't on corporate boards is because of the lack of refreshment of corporate boards. Um, and uh, so I, I've been very pleased. The reason why boards aren't re refreshed more often are lots and lots of reasons, but a lot of them, Leanne uh, correctly stated about the sensitivities, the nuances, the delicate nature of these relationships, um, and frankly, a lot of people who aren't willing to have the tough conversation and ask uh, somebody, could be a man or a woman, uh, could be a young person or an old person, that isn't um, performing for whatever reason to leave the board. It just seems to be it's much easier to just keep rolling it forward. Um, so I have heard from numerous CEOs about their frustration with their boards and I feel like I've been responsible in a couple of situations for giving the CEOs the courage of their convictions and getting them to actually have a tough conversation. Um, and then most recently, last week, I was meeting with a chairman, a man, 72 years old, um, and we have a stack of great female candidates. And sometimes you hear, well, we only have a spot for one. And so I said to him, if, you, if you've ever thought about stack ranking your directors, and he said, I said, could you do that? He said, yes, I could. So I said, you know who's not the strong director or two in the room? And he said, yes, I do. So we don't need to go through a whole individual director evaluation. He said, no, we don't. I said, well, if you can stack rank them, isn't the question whether these uh, candidates that we've suggested to go on the board are better than the bottom directors on that stack ranking? And if that's the case, why wouldn't you add the new directors and ask the other ones to leave? And he looked at me and he said, nobody's ever asked me that question. So I feel like going around, like, you know, planting these little seeds um, is very gratifying for me. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to encourage the uh, audience to send in their questions and we'll start to answer uh, a couple of the questions that we've received. And I'm um, going to direct the first question here to, to Cynthia. Uh, the, the question is, is shareholder approval of a director a rubber stamp? Uh, and I think this is an interesting question uh, in view of uh, the index funds and, and large shareholders encouraging, uh, putting emphasis on the vote of the, the proxy in connection with uh, the selection of the proposal for board director slates. Can you uh, comment on this, Cynthia? Sure, and I think that the rest of that question um, said something about uh, 
do ma- the do manage does management own enough of the shares to basically elect the director? So, uh, no, management does not. Typically, in a large company, the vast majority of shares these days are owned by uh, institutional investors of all types, passive and active. Uh, so they are essentially driving the votes on directors. And there there are activists out there as well who have views on directors and, and if they get involved, then they certainly um, have, um, can influence uh, the vote. So um, the simple an- answer is no, it's not a rubber stamp. Uh, there's plenty of information out there for the variety of shareholders to vote on the directors. Uh, and that's why the non-gov process is so important so that the company is putting up qualified and respected people to be on the board. Um, but they can't, but it can be disputed and they don't, and board members don't always win. I mean, it, it, they, they don't always get elected. Thank you. Beth, we have a question here with respect to um, attorneys. Do you have any specific advice for attorneys seeking a seated board position? Use your network. Gotcha. I have another question. It appears that all of you on the panel have worked public in public companies or professional services for public companies. What degree of crossover between public private company expertise and board membership is there? Beth, can you help us with that? Uh, yes, I think it's really quite different what happens in a private company versus a public company. And I, I briefly stated, a private company, there are two uh, things that are distinctly different. One is that the owners of that private company, generally a private equity firm or a VC firm, are meeting and talking with the uh, members of the management team throughout the two or three months or four months between each meeting. And so when you get to the meeting <clears throat> as an independent director, um, it, it's you really have to um, think about how you fit in and how you can be helpful um, because it's, there's real inside baseball that can happen. Um, it doesn't. That's just a caveat, and that's a difference. Uh, and on a public company, uh, basically everybody shows up every quarter, and there might there the conversations in between have been uh, you know relatively minor unless there's some crisis. Um, the advantage of the private company, though, is sometimes there are, are huge financial rewards, um, and uh, also you have the opportunity if you want to be more involved to take um, a role, a, a, you know, a more active role in the management of the company. And in, a pro- in the public company, as we discussed, you're really a much more um, supervisory. And so I would say those are the differences and they're both positive. And actually I know uh, women who love the idea of, you know, two or three uh, public companies and then fill in with private companies. Got it. Um... I'm going to open this one up to Leanne. Are there classes that board director candidates should take as a preparation for board service? Is that, and how do boards look upon that? Or do they care? I think we all have our perspective. It certainly is important to educate yourself and there's lots of um, resources available on the web and Margo, I think you've attached some uh, at the back. And the reason for doing that is so that you understand the language, the responsibilities, the duty of the board, but how you also can learn is through networking and talking to people who serve on public boards and understand the nuance of what that's like. Um, But uh, there's plenty of places to get sort of the nits and nats as well about service, but complement it with discussions with those who serve today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to mention in this vein that we are providing, when we post this, a, uh, a set of re- reference uh, information, a list. And what I would say is that for all of you who, who have interest in, in board roles and want to uh, look into it further, there's plenty of resources available on the internet 
there's or consultants and books there's a lot of information out there and so and you can either pay for it or get some of it for free and really the expectation is that you know don't obsess about the details you figure it out you can get someone to help you their resume you can do all that use your network wisely for the relationships and contacts for getting on a board and and having done your homework and so there's there's a lot of material available and the expectation is that you figure it out so uh unless there's i don't have any other questions from folks and i'm going to thank our uh our panel for doing a wonderful job in providing their valuable insights we're especially grateful to them for their time and thank you audience for joining us and we uh thank you and we're going to wrap up this concludes our webinar thank you thank you